the God of mercy, uh, the God of long-suffering who gave His life on the cross. But you've got to remember that at this time, Jesus is now coming to rescue His church. Can you say amen? He is at the point now where probation is over. It is done. He has looked down and He can see the final crisis and the tribulation that His people have gone through. Remember, Revelation talks about that last final crisis when the mark of the beast and the seal of God are given out. He has seen His church. He has seen His people persecuted and mocked and derided and treated with such hostility. And so it is now at this point where God looks at 6,000 years of sin on this earth and He basically says, enough is enough. He's coming to rescue His people. And His church ought to say... (laughs) Amen. Because that means He's coming to get you and me. He's coming to make war against Satan, against sin, against the wicked, and to get rid of it forever. That's why Revelation pictures it in a warlike fashion. Now, if we know Jesus, we don't have to worry. He ain't coming to make war on us. He's coming to make war upon the wicked. It goes on and it describes Jesus as wearing this robe dipped in blood. Now, obviously, that's symbolic. When you think about that, What event would that be pointing back to? It would be pointing back to the cross. Reminding us that even though Jesus is described as a warrior here, this is still the meek, humble, loving Savior who gave His life for His people, who gave His life for the world that they might have a chance to be saved. It's pointing us back to the cross of Christ. You know, Revelation does that a lot. We don't always see it. But there's a lot of symbolism that never lets us forget that the cross is always the top priority in Revelation. It ain't the beast. It ain't the mark. It ain't the antichrist. I mean, those are good subjects to know, but the focus of Revelation still is and always will be Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It keeps coming back to that. This symbolic description goes on and says there's a sword coming from His mouth. Well, again, we know it's not literal. We're not actually going to see Jesus, you know, biting down on a sword. It symbolically represents something. So what we have to ask ourselves is this. All throughout the Bible, what has a sword always been meant to represent? The Word of God. That's why Hebrews calls the Word of God a two-edged sword that pierces us with the truth. And so what Revelation is describing for us here is Jesus is coming to judge the world with the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is how we tell the difference between the genuine believer and the one who's just playing a game. You see, it's a real big difference between someone who just professes they want to follow God and someone who actually denies himself and follows Jesus with all his heart and with all his soul. Can you say amen? You see, a genuine believer doesn't make excuses when it comes to the Word of God. He doesn't compromise truth. She doesn't back down when people make fun of her, or people mock her, or people tell her there's something wrong with her for wanting to put Jesus first in her life, for wanting to lift the Bible above every other authority. They are willing to follow Christ and His truth no matter what. Even if they're made fun of, even if they're in the minority, no matter what the cost. And so Jesus is pictured as coming with the Word of God. And the Word of God will show us who has followed Jesus and who has not. That's the symbolic description. John goes on and describes the rest of this vision. Now I'm going to tell you, the next part of this vision is is rather graphic. Okay? I mean, John describes it vividly, what happens as Jesus comes. He's coming to rescue his church. But the wicked don't really like that. Notice what Revelation describes next. We're going to read verses 17 through 21. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather together for the supper of the great God. At first we may think, well, that sounds good. I want to be part of the supper of the great God. Not when you find out that you're the one for dinner. Because notice what the rest says. 
that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against who? Him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest, meaning the rest of the wicked, were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. I mean, that's, that's really... Uh, a blatantly vivid description. I want to put a summary of it on the screen here. Now keep in mind, again, this is symbolic. First of all, it describes that when Jesus comes, and he's coming with the armies of heaven, it's actually telling us and painting a picture that the wicked will make war against him. Did you see that picture there in the passage? You know, it describes the beast and the wicked men of the earth, the kings of the earth. They seek to make war. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that's going to look like. But we know that when Jesus comes, in a sense, the wicked are basically kind of divided into two groups. Because when we studied the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6, you remember, it pictures a group of people who see Jesus coming. And it says they run to the mountains crying for the rocks to fall on them. They say, hide us from the face of the Lamb. Hide us from His wrath. They know they're lost. They know they've rejected the gift of salvation. They seek to run from Jesus. But then you have a second group here in this passage, I mean, and they are the bold, emboldened, brazen sinners who actually seek to make war with Christ and the heavenly host. I have no idea what they're thinking. I have no idea how a human mind can think that man-made weapons of war can actually stop the heavenly host from coming. Now, I don't know what that means in the sense that I don't know if that means that all the great political leaders, the kings of the earth, are, are going to go and shoot missiles and rockets up at the heavenly host, or they're going to they're get out their airplanes and seek to bomb them. I have no idea what that means. All I know is that in some way, Revelation pictures them as making war against Christ when he comes. But you know, the Bible says that no weapon fashioned by human hands will ever be able to conquer Christ and His heavenly host. And so Revelation 19 then gives us the picture that the wicked are slain by the glory of God. They're pictured as lying dead all upon the face of the earth. And it gives us this, this morbid scene of the birds literally feeding on their corpses. I mean, it's just a really hard description. But you know what it tells me? The basic lesson is sin doesn't pay. Because this is the result. Revelation 19 is telling us. Notice the type of people that are lost here. It includes all different kinds. It talks about kings, political leaders. It talks about captains, mighty men, people who are rich, people who are poor. People who are small in the world's eyes. People who are great in the world's eyes. See, this tells me that when Jesus comes, the only thing that really matters is, have I chosen to follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Can I get an amen from somebody? It's not going to matter how much money may be in my bank account. It's not going to matter if I'm a great business leader who has built many corporations and the great business leaders of the world all know my name. It doesn't matter if I haven't known Jesus. It's not going to matter if I'm a million-dollar athlete and how many balls I've dunked in the court or how many footballs I've spiked. It's not going to matter if millions of people can cheer my name in a stadium. If I have not followed Jesus, my life has been for naught. That's what it's telling me. You know, it doesn't matter if I'm a great political leader and I can make all men, all nations bow down to me. And the United Nations is in awe when I walk into one of their meetings. If I have not known Jesus, it wasn't worth it. Can you say amen? 
the popularity, the power, and the prestige, all that will matter is, have I followed Jesus in my life? Have I put his word above everything else? That's what this passage, that's one of the lessons it's bringing out to us. God makes a difference between those who follow him and those who do not. Now please understand, when it talks about this terrible scene of the wicked, it's not that God hates them. It's not that God wants them to be lost. God loves them. Can you say amen? God tried so hard through their life to reach them. But because they were willing to listen to all the other voices in the world, they never responded to the voice of Jesus. And God's heart is broken. He must get rid of sin, but his heart is still broken. That's the God of love. So far, this is what Revelation has shown us. These are the events, final events of earth's history, the second coming of Christ. The righteous dead are raised and taken to heaven. The righteous living are also taken to heaven. The wicked who were alive at Christ's coming, they are slain. They lie dead upon the face of the earth. We read the symbolic description here. The wicked who were already dead before that, they stay dead to the end of the thousand years. And so now we have Jesus coming, the righteous going to heaven, the wicked are destroyed, the thousand years begins. And you now begin to read about it beginning in chapter 20. I'd like to invite you to turn there. Revelation 19 talks about the second coming. Revelation 20 now tells us the thousand years will begin. So let's go there. Revelation chapter 20. I want to read the first three verses. Revelation 20, verse 1. Now I want you to picture this description in your mind. It's not as hard to understand as you may think. Revelation 20, verse 1. The Bible says, Then I saw an angel coming down from where? Heaven. Having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? There's the thousand years again. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Let's put a summary of that verse on the screen here, because it describes a few things, and it gives us some symbolic terms. First of all, Jesus has come. He's rescuing his church. The wicked have been slain. You have the beginning of the thousand years. And it describes that there is an angel who comes down from heaven with a great chain in his hand. He takes Satan and casts Satan into this place, this thing called the bottomless pit. And while he is there, whatever that is, he can deceive the nations no more till the thousand years are finished. You say, well, wow, what in the world is that all about? Now, granted, before you even interpret it, does this sound like a good thing or a bad thing for the devil? What do you think? That's not a hard question. Is this a good thing or a bad thing for the devil? That's, that's a bad thing for the devil. He, he's getting his just due here. So let's ask a couple questions. The first question that comes to mind would be what? What is the bottomless pit? And we could come up with all sorts of theories and, and all sorts of answers, but here's what we're going to discover. As we read a few more verses just a few minutes from now, and as you go back into the original language, what you will find is the bottomless pit is simply a symbolic way of describing this earth in its partially destroyed, desolated state after the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, you're going to see that as we look up some verses. The other way we know this is if you look at the Greek word that's behind bottomless pit, it is very similar to the word that is used in Genesis 1 where it describes the world as without form and void before God created life on it. Have you read Genesis 1? It said the earth was without form and void. So when you put those things together and we look up some more verses, which we're going to do, we discover this bottomless pit is simply referring to a partly destroyed, desolated earth 
cities broken down, mountains in upheaval. It's a destroyed earth. Satan is cast upon it. He is forced to stay here for a thousand years. And since all the wicked are lying dead upon the face of the earth, that's why it says he can deceive the nations no more. Because nobody is alive. Are you following me so far, yes or no? If you're following me, can I get an amen? Now, what does it mean to have a great chain? Well, it's obviously symbolic. I mean, do you think that you could bind a spiritual being like Satan with an actual chain from Walmart or something? I mean, that'd be impossible. But the chain tells us there's a restriction. Think about it. You have a dog, let's say, which me and my wife are battling with right now. Somebody put it into the mind of my four-year-old that she needs to have a Labrador. <laughs> And so now she's bugging us every day about that. But let's suppose we have a Labrador. And we want the dog to stay outside in the yard. So we build a nice little dog house, okay? And we put a chain out there. A chain is around the dog. What does the chain mean? The chain is doing what? Restricting the dog to stay in one place. The dog must stay in our yard. He cannot roam anywhere else. The angel takes Satan throws him into the bottomless pit, which is this desolated earth. He is forced to roam a partially destroyed earth for a thousand years. You say, what's the point of that? Remember, there's no one to deceive. All the wicked have been slain. Uh, the righteous are already in heaven, joining the peace uh, of the kingdom of God. You see what this is? This is God's way of saying to Satan, you brought sin into the world. You're the one that started the rebellion. You're the one that brought sorrow and degradation. You're the one that caused all of these people to be lost who are now lying dead on the face of the earth. You caused sin, so now you're going to live in it for a thousand years. And that's going to be hell on earth for the devil because he has absolutely nobody to tempt. For a thousand years. He gets to think about the results of the rebellion he started so long ago as the angel Lucifer in heaven and the rebellion he brought to this earth in the Garden of Eden. Let me show you a description of what happens to this earth when Jesus comes because I want to give you this picture of a, of a desolated earth. In 2 Peter 3.10, it describes this. The Bible says, But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night. Now, I'm going to digress for about 60 seconds really quick. Can I switch top subjects for about 60 seconds here? Because there's just a lesson here I just cannot pass up. This is a very popular phrase. You remember when we studied the second coming of Jesus? And it described that when Jesus comes, we're going to see it, we're going to hear it, we're going to know it. But many times we, we hear people say, well, you know, it's going to be a secret coming where he just snatches his church away and then others are left behind. And many times this phrase, he's coming as a thief in the night, is used to support that. I want you to notice, that is one phrase taken out of an entire verse. When you read the whole verse in its context, there is absolutely nothing in there that supports anything being secret. This is why it's important to always read the Bible in its context. The thief in the night simply means he comes unexpectedly. Let's read the whole verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a secret noise, a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So when Jesus comes, you see this is going to be a partially destroyed earth. The elements melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works in it are burned up partially destroyed and desolate, this is the bottomless pit in which Satan is forced to stay. Now, God actually gave some of his Old Testament prophets a vision of what this earth would look like during the millennium. I want to cover a few of them because it will help us to understand this bottomless pit idea. The first one is in Jeremiah 4. Just keep your finger in Revelation because we're going back there. But let's go to Jeremiah, what chapter? Chapter 4, verse 23. Jeremiah 4, 23. Now this is what you call a dual or a double application prophecy because it refers to things happening in Jeremiah's time, 
But when you read it, you can also see it is also referring to the period of the millennium as well. And you'll see that in the description. Jeremiah 4, let's read verses 23 to 27. The Bible says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was what? Without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no what? No man. No man alive. You know that's referring to the millennium. And all the birds of the heaven had fled. There's those birds. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. And all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be made desolate, yet I will not make a full end. I want to put a summary of that on the screen. Jeremiah describes the earth being without form and void. He describes the earth as having no light. The mountains and hills have been moved, no doubt, by seismic upheaval. The land is a wilderness. The cities are broken down and destroyed. There is no life on the earth. That's what Jeremiah is describing. He's looking ahead to the millennial period. The earth desolated, destroyed, the bottomless pit. Isaiah was also given a vision of this time. And I want you to notice a certain word that he uses here. Isaiah 24, 19. This one I've written on the screen. All these verses will be in your notes that you can study at home. The Bible says, The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and totter like a hut. Its transgression will be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. Now notice what's next. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the what? There's that word, pit, referring to this partially desolated earth. That's how Isaiah uses it. So as we take more and more scriptures, we compare them with Revelation, we see the bottomless pit means this partly destroyed, desolated earth. He says the prisoners or the evil men will be gathered together in the pit. That's this earth. They will be shut up in the prison, and after many days, they will be punished. Even Isaiah 14 says this. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, that's the grave, to the lowest depths of the what? The pit. Isaiah long ago said Satan would be placed in the depths of the pit. Revelation said the angel chains Satan, throws him into the bottomless pit, a desolated, destroyed earth. See, I kind of picture this in my mind. When you first buy a dog... What's one of the first things you want to train him to do? Oh, before sitting up, do what? Uh, potty train, you might say. How to go to the bathroom properly, you could say, outside. And does that usually happen in a day? No, in fact, there's probably some times where, you know, you've placed, you go away and you've placed your newspaper where it's supposed to be, and you come home and what has the nice little doggy done? Nice little pile on your brand new carpet. And after this happens a few times, your Christian patience is tested. And you get a little bit upset. And maybe you might even take the dog and you take the dog's face and you, you push it towards the poop and say, Look, bad dog, bad dog, don't do that. Now, if you're a dog lurker, you probably don't like that example. <laughs> but that's what, this, that's what God is doing to Satan. He's saying, you created this mess you brought sin into the world, you're going to live it, and he pushes his face into the bottomless pit and says, you're going to live here during the millennium while my saints are enjoying peace in heaven, and you'll have not a soul to be able to tempt. This is the beginning of the devil's punishment. And imagine what that'll be like a thousand years to think about it. He'll see people that he's brought to sin and degradation. He'll see their bodies lying dead. 
on the earth. But he will, what also will come to his mind is the ones who Christ rescued. That young man who ended up in prison because of the home he grew up in. That young man who was selling drugs along the street corners to school children. That young man who was once in the grasp of Satan, wasting his life away in prison, somehow got a hold of a Bible that a dear Christian came when he visited him in that prison. And that young man began to read that Bible. And that young man who may not have understood everything at first began to realize that even someone like him can be changed and saved through the grace of Christ. And over a period of years, as he prayed, as the Holy Spirit converted him, as he learned about the gospel story, he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Maybe he even won other prisoners to Jesus. And when he got out, he had the opportunity to make a difference in this world. And while he's up in heaven enjoying a thousand years of peace, the devil is stuck in a desolated, destroyed earth. The devil is lost. The young man is saved because of Jesus Christ. You ought to say amen. But then there's some other questions. People wonder, well, you know, that makes sense. I can see that from Revelation, but what, what are we doing in heaven for a thousand years? What, what, what's going to happen to us? Well, I imagine that we're going to be healing from the sin we've experienced on this earth. Can you say amen? All, all the hurt, the trials, the pain we've gone through, things we didn't understand. After living here for what, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, depending on how old you, you may have been, we're going to need time to heal. Time to grow closer to Jesus. Time to be able to appreciate that heaven was made available to us by the blood of the Lamb. We'll have a chance, no doubt, to walk the streets of gold and to, to fellowship with the saints of old. Can you say amen? I mean, it'd be like, for a thousand years, we can, we can talk to Moses. Moses, tell me what it was like when you went before Pharaoh. Talk to some of the children of Israel. What was it like to walk across the Red Sea and to see, to see those walls of water, you know, uh, hundreds of feet high? Elijah, what was it like to go to heaven in a chariot of fire? You know? Daniel, what were you thinking when they cast you into the den of lions? Peter, how did you feel when you denied Christ? Paul, what was it like as you traveled to all these different places? You might even ask some of the reformers of old, John Huss, how did you feel when you were burned and they were taking you to the stake? You know? What were you thinking? Martin Luther, how did you feel when you stood before the council and said, here I stand upon the word of God? Be able to talk with other Christians whose names might not be written in the history books. Christians in other countries who've been persecuted, nobody knows their name, but we can still hear their story. It's like we're going to have a 1,000 year testimonial meeting, can you say amen? And our faith will be strengthened because we will realize Though we may be small in number compared to the, to the wicked of the earth, we'll realize that there are many people who are saved because of the grace of Jesus Christ. It'll be a wonderful thousand-year vacation in the kingdom of heaven. Somebody ought to say amen. But we also might have some questions, too. Because when we get to heaven, there might be a couple surprises, do you think? One surprise may be, there's going to be some people there that you thought would never be there. And there's going to be some people who aren't there that you thought for sure would be there. And we may have some questions. They say, God, I don't understand. I knew my friend so-and-so. I mean, she always helped the poor. She had a homeless ministry. But she's not here, Lord. And this guy over here, I knew him. I knew what he was like. And what's he doing here? And my friend is not. And we might have questions. Come on, let's be real. And what's God going to say? Well, I'm sorry. That's just the judgment I made. You're going to have to live with it. That's how sin began the first time. Seeds of doubt. Satan, Lucifer telling the angels, God is not love. God is not just. God's judgments cannot be trusted. 
And if our questions aren't answered, then there's the possibility that that same seed of doubt could be planted in our mind again, and we'll go through this whole realm of sin again. I don't want to do that to you. So you know what God does? The loving God of the universe, who has nothing to hide, Revelation says he opens up the record books of heaven and he allows us to look through them and to get our questions answered. I want to show you this description in the book of Revelation. Go back to Revelation now. I hope you kept your finger there. Revelation chapter 20. You know, I lost my place. You're probably already there. Revelation 20. And I want to read verse 4 now because verse 4 is describing a little bit of what the saints are doing during the thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4, the Bible says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those, and remember last night we learned a soul is a person. So all it's saying is, basically, I saw the souls or the persons of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now notice. And they lived and reigned with Christ, how long? A thousand years. Now notice in there, in the beginning of verse 4, it says that they are seated on thrones and judgment is committed to them. But what do you mean, what judgment? The Bible says we're going to have opportunity to look through the record books and see the judgments that God has made, to know for ourselves that God is righteous, that God is just, that He made the right decision. Not that we're going to change God's mind, because when we see it, we'll know that he was righteous and just. Because Paul alluded to this even in 1 Corinthians. I want to show you something here briefly. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul was writing to the Christians in Corinth. And they had real problems. He talked about a dysfunctional church. This church had serious problems. In Corinth, Christians were suing each other. They couldn't get along. They were taking each other to secular courts and suing each other. Can you imagine what kind of witness that is? Oh, yes, come accept the Christian faith. We all love one another. We're a brotherhood. But then we're going to go to the secular world and sue each other. What kind of witness is that? And so this is what Paul says in one of his letters. He says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Meaning the evil angels. How much more things that pertain to this life? See, Paul is reminding them, you better learn how to get together here on earth and make judgments between each other because do you not know we will judge the world? Do you not know we will judge angels? And what Paul is referring to is exactly what's written there in Revelation, that when we are in heaven, it says God sits us on thrones, we get to look through the record books. We will understand why this person was not saved. Perhaps we'll get to understand and see what could not be seen with human eyes, but God could. What happened behind the scenes, what happened in the corners that nobody saw. And we'll understand why this other person is saved when all we saw in their life was evil. But yet God will be able to show us in the record books that after we lost touch with that person, something happened in their life. And they were changed, they were converted, they came to Christ, and we never knew that. But you know what I imagine we will also have an opportunity to do? Look through our own book and be able to ask God why. Why He allowed certain things to happen in our life. Why, God, did you let my mother die of cancer when I was young? Why did you let me lose my job when I was 31? Why did you let me lose my child at such a young age? Lord, why did you let these tragedies come? Why didn't you intervene? Because let's be honest. I think all of us probably have some questions we'd like to ask God of why. Not in a way that we're condemning him or just saying, God, I, I don't understand. And God, being the loving God he is, he says, my children, I'm going to open the books before you. You can see for yourself. And during those thousand years, we can have every question answered about our life. And then we will truly be able to say with the angels, O oh God Almighty, your ways are just, your ways are true, your ways are righteous. And there will be no more questions. There will be no seeds of doubt in our mind because we know that what God did was right. Can you say amen? 
One Christian writer put it this way, and I can't remember the quote exactly, but one Christian writer said, when we look through those books and we see how God handled our life, we will be able to walk away saying, God, I would not have wanted you to handle it any differently. Because we'll see the whole picture the way that God saw it. Problem is we can't see the whole picture here on earth. Our vision is so limited. We just trust God until he opens all things into our sight. Can you say amen? But there is something that happens when the thousand years is over. So let's go back to the book of Revelation. Revelation 20. Now I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. This describes the end of the thousand years. And the last 10 minutes of this message is actually going to be the prelude to Tuesday's message because it talks about hell just a very, very briefly. Revelation 20, verse 7. The Bible says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Right here it says, thousand years is over. Satan's now, now released, and he goes out to deceive the nations. And as soon as you read that, what's the first question that comes to your mind? Come on now, what is it? What nations? Everybody's dead. And you know what happens? It's almost as though while John was writing this in vision, a little bit later, by the time he gets to verse 11, he realizes, you know, I need to fill in a little more detail there. Because you have to go to verses 11 to 13. And when you read verses 11 to 13, it answers the question. Because what happens at the end of the thousand years is the second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation. That's when the wicked are resurrected to face judgment. They haven't got a chance to look through the books. They, they're going to face God and understand why they are lost. Because remember, Paul wrote that there will be a time when every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That includes the wicked. That doesn't mean they're going to confess it as if they're going to follow him, but they're going to recognize that, that his judgments were righteous and just. Notice what is written in verses 11 to 13. Revelation 20, verse 11. The Bible says, this is the great white throne judgment. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there, was no, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the who? Dead. Now this is the wicked dead. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. And then verses 14 and 15 talk about them being thrown into the lake of fire because it's the resurrection of the wicked. And so what happens here that Revelation is describing for us, the thousand years is now over. The resurrection of the wicked is taking place. At the same time, chapter 21 describes the holy city, the new Jerusalem, begins to descend out of heaven from God onto this earth because God's going to create a new earth. And so while all that is happening, the wicked have been resurrected. Satan is released from his prison. And so now he goes out to deceive the nations. And he says to them, See, you're going to be lost anyway. God has judged you unworthy. But look at us. Our numbers are as great as the sand of the sea. We are many times more than these righteous inside the city. And it says that he gathers them together to battle against the saints in the city and against God Almighty. And it is at that point that every living being in the universe can see neither Satan nor the wicked have changed. A thousand years hasn't changed the devil's character. And even for the wicked, standing before God, looking through the books, understanding why they are lost, it doesn't change them either. And so at that point, every living being will be able to say, God is righteous, God is just. And then comes verse 9. Verse 9 says, Revelation 20, verse 9, They went up, the, the wicked, they went up on the breadth of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. 
That is the hellfire of the Bible. Not some cavern in the middle of the earth. That's the hellfire from the Bible that destroys Satan, destroys sin, destroys the wicked, purifies the earth forever. You ought to say amen. (laughs) And then God creates a new heavens and a new earth. At that moment, it is clear. God is just. The fire comes down from God. Sin and Satan are gotten rid of forever. Sin will never rise again. And then comes the beautiful promise of Revelation 21, which says, After all this is finished, John writes in vision, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain. It's the end of sin. Now God creates the new earth. And Revelation 21 says that God will dwell with his people. The new Jerusalem will be a part of a new earth, a perfect earth, the way it was supposed to be at the beginning. It's almost like the Garden of Eden all over again. Sin came into the garden and messed things up in Genesis. God restores it in the last chapter of the Bible. And so, brothers and sisters, what Revelation is calling to us to do is to make sure that when Jesus comes, We are ready. I don't want to be in that group that numbers the sand of the sea, who's trying to make war against God and the holy city. I want to be one of those people who are inside the city. Not because I was perfect or righteous, but because we chose to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and follow Him. He opens the door to the new Jerusalem. I'd like to end tonight with one last story. When I met Marquita, she may not know I'm telling this story. (laughs) When I met Marquita, and we would go down to visit her family in Alabama, her dad had an interesting thing that he liked to do that I thought was a little weird at first. No, she knows the story, actually. When we would go visit her grandparents, he would like to stop at the local cemeteries and walk through and read the gravestones of past family members or descendants from generations ago. First, I thought that was a wee bit morbid. (laughs) You know, when you're 21, 22, that's not really something that interests you, walking through a cemetery looking at gravestones. But when you do, you notice something. If you ever go into a cemetery, you go to the front part where the graves are, are, are nice and fresh and someone's recently been buried there. You always notice that on many of them, there's flowers there. Somebody remembered them. It's always freshly mown and cut. The writing on the tombstone is quite legible. It's obvious someone remembers that person. Someone still loves them. You go a little farther back in the graveyard, and you get to the graves that are maybe, you know, 30 years old or so. There's not as many flowers on those graves. Sometimes there's weeds growing up. Sometimes the tombstone's a little cracked. Sometimes it's kind of hard to read the words. And it becomes obvious that over time, people have forgotten. You go to the back of the cemetery. You go to the graves that are like 50 and 60 years old, and it's a whole different story. Very rarely are they mowed fresh. Very rarely will you see flowers on there. And many a times, depending what cemetery, that tombstone could almost be broken in half. You can't read anything on it. And it's become very obvious that almost nobody in the world remembers that person anymore. But yet those might have been people who worried so much about what their friends and family thought. Spent half their life trying to earn earthly riches. Build a business with power and prestige. But brothers and sisters, the truth is, a few years after you and I die, most people aren't going to care to remember our name. Fifty years after we die, most people will have forgotten about us. The only thing that's going to matter is does Jesus know my name? And will I come up in the resurrection? the righteous. The Bible has said 
What shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul? Whatever obstacles we have between us and Jesus, let's allow him to remove them. Whatever choices and decisions that we need to make about putting Jesus and his truth first, let's make those decisions so that we can know we're following him with all of our heart, all of our soul, and all of our mind. Because I want Jesus to know my name. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that there is something called the millennium where we can heal. We thank you, Lord, that Revelation gives us the picture that sin will be gotten rid of in one day. We will not live in it forever. Father, if there be any obstacles in any of our lives, including my own, maybe, I don't know, some habit, maybe some weakness, just some difficulty that we're struggling with, we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to just take away any desires we may have for things that separate us from you and create in us, Lord, a priority love for you, that you would be the number one relationship within our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I do know we have a special music before we depart tonight, and I'd like to invite that individual to come, and I know it's not Joseph again, uh, Mrs. Basham. I'm going to give her a chance to sing her song tonight, and just as we do, just remember this picture. What does it profit a man to lose his soul, or to gain the whole world, and yet lose his soul?
Tuesday night, we'll talk more about verse 9 that talks about this fire coming down from God out of heaven. And we'll go into the scriptures and understand what does the Bible teach about this fire that destroys sin and Satan and the wicked. And we're still going to see God's love in it. Heavenly Father, thank you again that your scriptures are so clear. And thank you that you've given everything that we might be saved. Bless each family here tonight. Guide them throughout the work week. Bless them, Lord, that all may be able to return Tuesday to understand uh, the purposes of Revelation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a good night. We'll see you.